Uh, let's get ready to roll. I, I stand between uh, you and lunch. <laughs> more, impor more importantly, I stand between my, my stomach and justice. So uh, for selfish purposes, let me get going. So last time we were talking about, uh, as we've been talking about, we've been talking about this sort of idea of uh, having a static language and a, a dynamic language. And then last time, we started this process of weaving the two together so that you have uh, both of them in one. And the way I approached it was to say, let's be really particularly naive about it. Um, it's easy to start kind of jumping straight forward into like, oh, let's like follow our nose and go straight to what seems like an obvious thing. And maybe we'll end, what we're gonna do is possibly end up at a place that was like, oh, I could have shortcutted there, but I kind of wanted to raise a number of issues in how we think about doing this, even though, so that we can make sure that we understand why we got a particular answer rather than happened to get an answer and not a good explanation for why it makes sense. And uh, in my mind, this is one of the really tricky questions uh, in research and gradual typing because you sort of have to ask, what are really the questions? What's the framework in which you're thinking? And uh, what are the broader implications? And this in many ways affects the various kinds of research that people who have been looking at combining languages with different power type systems. Uh, if you start from different uh, assumptions, you'll end up with a very different solution that solves a certain kind of problem in a, different, in a, a particular sort of paradigm of thinking. So to understand the literature, you sort of have to understand where it's the headspace of the researcher so that you can tell whether or not like even your starting assumptions are the same. Um, now what's been interesting is that in many ways, the, the way that I'm presenting this here, and, and it's not the only way that people look at, at gradual typing, but it really does fit in with this kind of multi-language semantics where you, in, on some level you really have uh, a language and you have another language and then there's this question of what happens when you link them either practically or conceptually. Now part of that that uh, I focused on a lot the first day was this idea that thinking about what your statics versus your dynamics are matters when you're thinking about your language. It's like really if your statics have uh, uh, I can't believe I started using statics for a long time. I was like, why would I say that? But I was like, oh no, it sort of makes sense now. So, you know, Bob's right, um, as usual. Uh, <laughs> except when he's not. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, uh, luckily I have tenure now. So, uh, <laughs> so um, but there's this idea that if the structure of your language bakes, in, bakes into its core some reasoning principles that, that are in, endow the way you structure your programs directly, then you want to kind of think about in what way can I preserve them when I've actually in some way done violence to my language, which is what we are doing. Like in Frank's terms, we've, we've done some violence to our language by introducing dynamics into the static language. And you can think about it either way, like why did you like pepper my language with these static types? Either way, they both affect each other. It's, uh, it's kind of this golden braid. So before I dive in, kind of the, the big theme here is, is that, yeah, like we follow our nose, we're gonna try and build a language. Some interesting questions are gonna come up about how it should behave, having kind of taken a point of view on statics. Some of it'll be like, there's some weird corners of the statics as I pointed out last time. And then there's this issue of, well, if those things have some sort of semantic meaning, then how does that affect the, the design of the language? And in a certain way, we're gonna find that a, because of the nature of these languages being sister languages, we'll be able to say that a lot of things collapse away and uh, types end up being kind of, to, to, in my mind, the key, but in a, a, a very particular style which leads into the research work on gradual typing that I've been doing in a, a number of others in the particular space. Um, so before I, I keep going, can, uh, uh, are there questions from last time or before? Okay, so let me, d let me dive in. So last time I kind of left you with this problem, which was how do we, d how do we like, uh, take these two languages and hook them together? And my answer was roughly, take these two languages and hook them together. Uh, where hook them together, basically was that, these two pieces. Now here I was just basically talking about this sort of 
uh, as I was saying, sort of this, this, the formation rules of the language, which doesn't really tell you anything about what kind of behavior or reasoning we're going to get. And in essence, I, I made a lot of fun of the Fonz because it really looks like uh, there was this great line on, on Slack, uh, I think it was um, John, uh, John Sterling said it's like, oh, the check judgment is like the participation award of uh, uh, typing judgments, <laughs> which I thought was really funny. And, but at, at the same time, you also want to remember that uh, actually the, the checking judgment does check your trunk to see if you're hiding static, static language stuff inside your program. So it, it is doing a little bit more, but on the surface it really looks like it's not doing anything. However, if you only have a dynamic language. It really is the, like the participation word, like everyone's a program, it's cool, like take your, you know, take your sticker and go home. So it's the blend that, in, that's a sense in which uh, adding statics has done, uh, uh, made changes to the language. We've gone from a sort of trivial uh, formation rules to meaningful forma or formation rules that are non-trivial, shall we say. The question is whether they're meaningful. <coughs> So now all of this I, I, I went over yesterday. Uh, still keep this rule in mind where the dynamics suddenly manage li to like have every static, the dynamic language when you stick it in gets every static type. We're gonna revisit that. And I led you through the idea that our reduction semantic, that the, the reduction rules, the, the dynamic uh, semantics of the language ends up, ended up being this like Cartesian product kind of thing going on where you're sort of like, oh, if, a, like, if, if locally I can see everything as if it was fully static, then just do that. If it's dynamic, do that. And then you're worried about what's the interaction between these two. And I kind of pushed you in a certain direction by uh, laying out uh, a few of these pieces. Like I told you what I counted as values, and that was to kind of uh, uh, push you in a particular direction. Not that it's necessarily the right one, but it was one to think about. Yeah, question. Yeah. Ah, let me answer that question. Am I in the right file? Yeah. So, that would be right up here, and there's an if. So it was the dynamics ones, right? Interesting, because my question is then, is there something, <coughs> ah, that's why. Okay, does that answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a mistake. Um, Good eye, though, but what, it, what, it, what that does show is that like, as we're trying to be very uh, rational and systematic about these things, then things might catch our eye like that to say like, huh, that's a little funky. What's the static? How did static code end up in the dynamic language without crossing a border? In many ways, like you just saw a talk that's very much about talking about crossing borders between two languages. Cool, other questions? Mm -hmm. Ah, okay, you're like, cool, so, so you should thank Michael Greenberg for his, his, his taste in colors and uh, uh, LaTeX X color package for making this possible. Uh, they don't sponsor me, but I, I do. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so part of, part, of, part of this is, yeah, things line up in a, a pretty clean way, um, but what's interesting is we'll find as we go along today that there's some sort of asymmetries that happen when you, stop, when you start pushing on this idea, and I'll, I'll, I'll focus on that in just a minute. So, uh, so this is sort of like, let me give away a, like a bunch of answers um, from, from your home, uh, quote unquote. And it's like, okay, yeah, so, you know, if, w w when, in sta when, in, when in the static language, be like the static language, when in the dynamic language, be like the dynamic language, and then like, here's some interactions and then here's some interactions. And each of these is basically re repetitions of these rules, but now since I said that uh, I was going to make the decision that I was gonna consider um, 
dynamic language program, uh, values to basically be static language values and vice versa, it made it really easy for me to see what the next thing to do is, right? To follow my nose. So, so far it's like, okay, that's cool. But uh, uh, in the last lecture, Amal started to allude to this issue that should, one issue that should start to concern you, which is, what if my language is not this particularly boring? What if I have functions? And so if, I, oh, yeah. Uh huh. It's it's good question. Ah, yeah, <laughs> good question. That's the that's part of the answer. But let me. Uh, so it's Aaron, is it? Yeah. So let let me kind of fill in what's going on here because it's like that seems to not type check, and this is where uh, the the red footnote comes into play, which is worth talking about for a second. Because um, I, was, I was trying to think, like, what's the best way to think about this? Because really, at the end of the day, what I, what I was doing was more uh, giving you a sense that you could see the symmetries rather than saying something specific. And the, the way I set up the system was I was saying, these are all literally the same thing. Uh, I, I don't really have a different set of Booleans. I don't really have a different set of numbers. I could set up the system that way, like formally. I could say there's like uh, two different families, or I have, tagged set, I have tagged sets where I have the tag dynamic and the number, and then the tag static and a number, and the same thing with trues and falses. What ends up being important is that we have a one-to-one -one correspondence between any two of these sets, between the dynamic booleans and the static booleans, and the dynamic numbers and the static numbers. And so how you set up your formalism uh, any way you set up your formalism, you're going to expect that you have a function that maps both ways and that's identity when you compose it either way. So they're like set theoretically isomorphic. So what the syntax up here is basically saying is uh, the, in the predecessor case, nd is really, is really an n and I'm implicitly, like you, there's two ways to look at it. One is N, D, and N are the same thing, and I'm playing a pun, but I just didn't put a D on it to say it's literally the same thing, but now I'm focusing on the fact that I'm doing mathematics, uh, like in racket. Uh, another way to look at it is that maybe N, D, and N are different things. N is a mathematical number, N, D is sort of a, a tagged number, and I'm implicitly applying a, the, my map from racket uh, racket dynamic numbers to mathematical numbers, doing the math and then mapping it back, knowing that I'll get uh, the same meaning in both worlds. Does that kind of help answer your question? So really, the, 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 a rough way to put it is that sometimes uh, both like semanticists and mathematicians start to blur lines that you can make explicit. And in many cases, when I say that when I say that the dynamic language is the same as the static language, that doesn't mean that literally the syntax is going to be exactly the same, but in some way I have uh, a one-to-one -one, uh, mapping back and forth so that I can always talk in one world and then translate back. It'd be like if Google Translate didn't actually suck. Um, <laughs> so that if I translated from English to Spanish to English, I'd always get the exact same thing. It's like they're exactly tight and meaningful. You look a, still a little bit concerned. It, it's, 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 it's yeah, I was just wondering because, because what, what's going on here is, I mean, we have, we, we have a dynamic number uh -huh. in the true bracket, mm -hmm. and then we're kind of, yeah, translating it in whatever way, way fits us into a true number. Yeah, so, so there's, um, in a sense, like, in a sense what I'm kind of saying is you can, blur those, those issues without thinking about them. Uh, but when you get to the formal mathematics, you might want to make it explicit, and sometimes it's useful to think about, and sometimes it's not. So the, the classic example of this, a classic example of this is just plain old BNF. Like whenever I write a BNF like this, well, let me go to the, one of the languages that's got a simple BNF. Um, so 
Uh, let me go to, where's the T? Ah, there's terms. OK, so here we've got a simple BNF, right? And as a programmer, you're sort of like, yeah, it's an algebraic data type. OK. Um, mathematically, you might want to think about it as basically this is anything that, in, that is this any uh, encoding of uh, a constructor for each of these. So think, imagine like I, I have to have a function true that takes nothing, a function false that takes nothing, a function if that takes three things, uh, a function n that takes a natural number and gives me something, and then successor, predecessor, and zero. And I want the property that, I want a set of properties. Basically, each of those functions has to be one to one into a, a space, like you know, the space of, uh, I could say that they're each functions to, for instance, s expressions, right? And all they do is like spit out the s expression. And then, so that would be like one to one because you'd be like, oh, I can easily write a function that goes from an s expression uh, and gives me a selector for pieces. Uh, ooh, do I really want to show you this dirty trick? I'm getting a little sidetracked, but I, uh, so maybe I won't right now. But another example is you could go to natural numbers using a girdle encoding. And so then what I can basically say is, oh, the syntax of my language is like really, really big natural numbers. Or the, the, the syntax of my language is uh, S expressions. And in essence, I don't care. Because I can write a function that takes natural number embeddings of, of terms and turn it into S expressions, and I can take uh, the, the, and I can do the vice versa. And in a way, what I'm saying is, as long as you give me anything that, that satisfies those properties and I can always pull out a representation that I want, then I don't care about the fact that they're not exactly the same thing. So this, this is, um, I was alluding to this earlier, and that was what's called an initial algebra. And it's basically saying, here's a set of constructors with uh, a set of, uh, er with an arity. And from this point on, I'm just going to ignore my machine representation of that stuff and know that I can always get back the information I want. Um, I can show you, like, maybe during the hands-on session or something, like, this writ large. It just turns out that if you girdle and code, like, uh, a program with, like, two lines, it, like, racket just goes <laughs> like this. You get a number that's, like, this big. It's really kind of cool. Right, in the, same way that I d in the, the same way that you can't tell, in principle, if maybe I'm representing these using girdle encodings, and maybe I'm representing these using S expressions. But when you look at it, you're sort of like, yeah, they're kind of the same thing, but maybe they're kind of different. But, but in a certain sense in your mind, like both are true. Like semantically, you're like, yeah, they both represent true, the token that's true. They just might not look the same exactly. The difference is the color. You can make very different representations. Like what I could have done was just written down like, same and false actually is, the tr is true. And then like, same and true is false. And that would confuse you as a human being because why are you using things that are meaningful to me in the English language in this way, but it still makes perfect sense. So what I'm doing is sort of uh, down here, I'm just not committing, well in a certain sense up here, where I said this, that they're all the same, from the same place. They're all numbers. So you would expect that the, the dynamic number five is the same as the static number five is the same as the black number five. And I'm just making an emphasis that like, I want to keep track of where I, where I am. And that was because I didn't want to go through the trouble of building three sets of natural numbers, uh, including the originals. Um, the reason I'm taking a little time on this is this is one of those like mathematical subtleties that you sometimes n that get glossed over pretty quickly and you don't find out until like after you have a job um, <laughs> and then realize that it's sometimes useful to recognize that that's happening in papers. But we can talk about it more later. I just wanted to do, I did want to give it a little due diligence. It's, it's something that's reasonably confusing. Other questions? <coughs> Okay, so lots and lots of rules. Things start to get really funky, like I'm not actually done yet, <laughs> it turns out. And I know this because Robbie Findler. Um, so when I was building the system, so right, so this is uh, the MBA file. Um, 
and this one is done, but there's some funk that goes on when you start having to deal with what happens, what happens when I do round trips. How do I think about round trips? What happens if I go through the static language into the dynamic language and back out to the static language? What happens if I start in the dynamic language, go into the static language, and go back out to the dynamic language, right? So if you're, if you're purely thinking kind of operationally, like, yeah, write an interpreter, like you, 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 you start thinking about, yeah, I want to come up with something that will work, that will, in the sense of like, yeah, all my programs don't crash, but then you may forget about the fact that, oh, but the static language came with these statics, which I hope will have something to do with reasoning principles. And I want to kind of think a bit about what that might mean and how I might preserve that, because uh, that form, those formation rules I'm treating as intrinsic to my language, not an external static analysis that I'm adding, but something that is part of what makes a program legal. So we could end up in a couple of situations. And I'll just write them down and let's just talk about them briefly. Pretty sure I did the wrong one this time. Oh no, I got it right, okay. So I could have something dynamic that's grounded and then lifted. Or I can have something that's, oh, I got the colors right and the brackets wrong, yeah. This is why gradual typing is bad. Uh. <laughs> Too many colors. Can we be monochrome? Good old green on black days. Um, so these are kind of the two situations that we want to think about in a way, and if they were going to run under any circumstance, right? Because a lot of what I did, I was able to avoid most of this stuff by just saying, yeah, just treat, treat the dynamic true as if it was a static true. Don't bother worrying about it, right? Now, in particular, I might change this into a, let, for the moment, let me make it a concrete example. Let's say, oh, I should have checked which color I had before I erased, but. Uh, yeah, anyway. Say I have a, a dynamic five to make it concrete or a static five. Okay. So you might be tempted to say, well, you know, so far everything has gone really nicely, so I'm just going to, let's see if I can get these right. That's red, that's black. Right? <laughs> so, you, so you might be like, yeah, like we'll just like whack them back and forth. So talk to me a bit about what you think about adding both of these rules to your system. <laughs> Unhappy. Uh, okay, tell me what well, you're thinking. What happens, for example, if you're dynamic five, your type is only static five, then things blow Good call. What if that had been typed at bool? Then you're suddenly like, oh, eh, whatever. It's in it now. We're good. Right? Um, that's a little concerning. right? The reason this is concerning is because we're thinking in terms of writing big programs by writing little programs and putting them together somehow whether it's by using a linker, whether it's by actually sticking two things next to one another, whether it's by wrapping something in a context. Especially when you're thinking about the statics, you want to think about what are my kind of modular compositional properties that I want to preserve or uh, maintain. Cool? So, so you kind of want to think about that one. This one is a little bit funkier in a way, right? Because you're like, oh, like this feels a little OK, locally, right? Sort of. Except hiding inside of this immediate thing here was that. And so if I, if I am a little more 
myopic and look at that, I may be concerned, right? For the same reason that I was concerned here, which is that looking in close, thinking compositionally, I could be worried that this might have been in a place that wanted a type bool. OK? So, oh, yeah. How could this come to be? No, no, you're not missing anything. This is great. Um, let's go to MBA and let me see if I can. OK. So what I'm going to do is take a, a program. And what I had over there would be that's the dynamic world, and I'm going to the static world. And I'm going to say, so from the dynamic world, give me a 5. And then 6 or 7. So what happens here is I had a program. I'm getting 5 from the dynamic world. That's exactly the equivalent from D. I decided not to unicodify those because I didn't want to have to type them because it's like alt 219D. Like, so, so it's like I had this thing, and I've stuck it in a context that's specifically expecting a Boolean value. So this is sort of the magic. And you can see the formation rules all work out fine. Because up here, I'm just like, it's 5. Yeah. And then this is like where the scary rule happens, where you're like, Oh, so from D5 is bool. That's the, that's exactly the gray, the gray, like, the gray rule happening. Cool? Questions? Yeah. Oh, so, well, let me write this one just so you can see it, uh, rather than me talk through it. Because I can, now that I know the syntax for this, I, or well, now that I have the art of cut and paste, I can just replace the program. <laughs> okay, so the first one is gonna be uh, from D, because it's red, five. And then I just get that, right? Where it says like, five's okay, so it's, so it's it gave me type nat, but, oh, it's also bool. <laughs> like, like, huh? So then the program on the bottom starts in the static world and goes to from stat, so from S5 to from D. And notice there's still two derivations. So it, it was 5, and then it was 5 again. And over here, it was, it, was, it, were, it was nat, and then it's nat again. And here it was nat, and now it's bool. So this is kind of the stuff, this is some of the stuff that you have to worry about when you're thinking about the, the language. And this gets even more complicated when you start thinking about adding more features to your language. So like right now, our only real notion of linking programs in this language is to build up bigger programs using either transfer back and forth or an immediate operator. But as, as I kind of alluded to last class, and that has been talked about in any language that's not totally lame, um, meaning lacking variables altogether, you at least at some point may have something like, like let in the static language, x, and you have sort of multiple options here, equals something in and you have multiple options. Did x appear in here, or does x not appear in here? So let's say I have let x equal something in 5, right? So I'm not even mentioning x, but I could have stuck one of these uh, transfers in. So let me grab the other pen just to be consistent with my coloring. <coughs> 
So I could say let x equals, you know, we're in the static world, so ground me a 5. Now, one thing I didn't do here is I didn't say anything about x's type. So maybe I'm going to be a little bit more careful in my static language and say, yeah, generally you should say, you know, when we think about formation rules for our programs, we'll often do something like say, yeah, we want to say that this thing appears in a context where gamma says x has type bool. Five, and you know, you'd sort of expect this to have type int, right? Or nat. Oh. <laughs> kind of make sense? So, what's hap one thing that's happening in this program is that, like, yeah, I used some modular reasoning principles to understand what's happening, and I committed to a type here. Um, not doing Hindley Milner, because the language wasn't Hindley Milner. Uh, and even then, if you add that, you still have issues to think about when it comes to combining these two languages. Um, so the question is, like, what do I, if I had a let in my language, what do I want the semantics of the language to do? Do I want it to mismatch here? Or do I want it to uh, run and produce five? Similarly, if I... Another question is, if I do have this, and I write it this way, and let's say I, I write, if x then 6, else 7. So now I've got this, I've got this type up here. And then I'm going here. And you might, you might have multiple points of view on this. Another might be, well, let's, let's do the Hindley-Milner thing, right? where you're like, OK, let's say I didn't annotate the type. Now, you know this program's going to, like, you, you would expect this program to crash, right? This one, regardless of what's going to happen, you expect it to go mismatch. When you're talking to the programmer, about at the high level, when you're reasoning at the high level, where did things go off the rails? Did it go off the rails the moment that you assigned this to x? Or did it go off the rails here? Is there something actually wrong with this program? Is it the case that if I took this as a program context, as a static language programmer, Have I done something wrong? And say, oh, no, there's an error at this spot in your code. It's yours. Like, it's your fault. Fix it. So these, these start to be the issues when you're thinking about modular reasoning about a, a language with an intrinsic static semantics. And this is what leads to uh, study of blame and how do you assign, how do you point at part of a program and say, this is the spot where things went wrong. And this gets, and it, it, it's a bit contrived in this context, but uh, it's funny. I told Sam I wasn't going to talk about blame, but yeah. <laughs> I, but I also wasn't using the word statics before, so I guess like, I, I learned a thing or two along the way. But the, the main point I wanted to make is even thinking about a first order language where, yeah, all I need to do is erase all the tops and bottoms and then just run it on uh, the BA runtime, and something will happen. The program will, be, the program will produce an answer because my safety proof says it does. But in what sense is that actually uh, enforcing the invariance that your source static type system is supposed to have given you, your local reasoning principles? So just because the program uh, always has an answer and does mismatch doesn't mean that it's re ref respecting the semantic ideas. Make sense? Any questions on this so far? In many ways, to me, this is the high-level idea when you're thinking about, when I'm thinking about gradual typing, is that uh, 
uh, it's also useful to say that this is what I mean when I'm distinguishing between sort of an intrinsic view of gradual typing where your types have local invariants where having a piece of code like this form in the static language gives me some reasoning principles that in some way are a lot are closely related to what I got in the fully static language. And the other point of view is what I'd call the extrinsic point of view is, yes, I managed to build a, a static semantics for a language that mixes the two. And maybe the way I'm thinking about it is, oh, every program had meaning already. And now I'm just, I use this, this uh, type system that I wrote to filter down to a smaller set of programs and then forget that the, the type system ever existed and use the original dynamic language runtime for the sister language that was bigger than the static language in the first place. Uh, that's doing a different thing. Um, uh, it's often like, that often appears under the, under the uh, or rather, the idea of taking the TBA type system, putting it on top of BA programs, and then running them in BA is often what's called um, pluggable type systems, where you're saying your dynamic, your, your language is, is fully defined without necessarily a type system. Then you use the type system as a further filter. And as long as you have sort of a whole, the whole program is typed using this type system, then you do still get these guarantees. And that was the part that is closely related to the sister language thing where I was saying every static, every program in TBA has the same meaning in, in uh, BA. But things get trickier when you start saying, I'm going to build a type system that has holes in it, where these holes are the, the red parts. It's not, nece it's not necessarily the case that you want to continue having that property that every program that passes that mixed system is going to have the same behavior in the, the system where you run it on the pure BA runtime. So that's kind of what I'd call the difference between like an extrinsic point of view and an intrinsic point of view, or uh, kind of pluggable typing versus intrinsic typing. Or uh, what's often called, like basically this is what gets called sound gradual typing. Uh, at least that's my interpretation of it, is that you really want to take the types seriously and view them locally, modularly, and, and, with res and having reasoning principles that are similar to the fully static language. And so when we talk about type checking, well, I'm doing a lot of um, talking. Let me, stop for, like, let me stop for a quick second and see if there's questions so far. OK. So there's a lot of kind of uh, terminological difficulty when people talk about dynamic language, dynamic typing and static typing, right? Uh, or dynamic type checking or static type checking. And, part of the, and that was part of why we had this conversation about the idea that types are metalinguistic things. It's a language for talking about the language that you're writing programs in, right? So in a certain sense, the term dynamic type checking, given that point of view, doesn't really make sense because it's like, I'm checking a meta language thing. And you're like, oh, but I've got this runtime type. It's like, it's like saying, like, I've got like my, my runtime deity in my hand. You know, the, the deity is outside the system. You can't really have a runtime deity like, on, that you carry with you. But what you can do is you can have things that you check in your program that naturally reflect invariants that the outside world could see. So it's like I can, I can internally in my language write down things that correspond to meta-language concepts, where it's like if I got to this point in my program, then I know some invariant. That's kind of what contracts give you. Uh, types give you that, like static types give you that same thing. Like syntactically, I know that if I get to this part of my program, then certain kinds of uh, code have come in and I can use that interface. So I like to talk about rather than checking, uh, static type checking or dynamic type checking, it, I talk about static enforcement or dynamic enforcement of types. Uh, but then, you know, I, I have many synonyms for it, one of which is like dynamic typing and static typing for the sake of having conversations with people. But I think it's useful to talk about the idea of enforcement as opposed to just talking about the idea of checking. Checking is very syntactic. It's not very semantic. But enforcement is saying, I have invariants that I'm going to protect somehow. And it may be the case that I need no runtime mechanism to do it if I'm fully statically typed. And I may need dynamic mechanisms to do it 
if I'm, uh, say, gradually typed or mixed typed. Good? OK, so, that, so that's the kind of big spiel. Now what I want to do is, is go back to the language for a bit. So we'll get concrete again rather than philosophical. What in the world just, oh, OK. Uh, oh, hi, Robbie. <laughs> Shout out to Robbie Fiddler. Yeah. So I want to go back here. And we'll get concrete again. Um, you know, I, I know I just threw like a bunch of kind of high level stuff at you and it might have just like shot over. Luckily it's being videotaped so you can hear what I said later, or ask me questions about it. It's taken me a while to get there. I think it's useful to have said once. Um, but you might also have, have noticed that I'm trying to be careful about the ideas. And I want to say that um, it's useful to make these distinctions to help you think about what happens when you combine languages. And that seems to work in like both linear, linear logic and intuitionistic logic or compiler correctness or even gradual typing. It's like many instances of the same phenomenon. Uh, okay. So now what I wanted to say is this is really horrifying when you look at this because I already told you the story about sister languages, right? Like this is not very sisterly. Uh, they're just like, I'm off in my place doing my thing, and uh, we just won't talk to one another except when we really have to. In a certain sense, the, n the nice thing is that we've, we've taken these two languages and put them together, and we can squash them. And then like really bring out the sense in which these two languages are really uh, so closely related. And make the distinctions go away. At least at the underlying level. Like, this might be the syntax that I want to write in, but I do not want to implement this runtime. That just makes me sad. So, uh, is this not the right? Ah, OK. So that's my old semantics, which I haven't updated. So, what I'm going to do here, you can ignore the last page, because that's the same as this page. Uh, but what I wanted to talk about was this minimal mixed Boolean and arithmetic language. <coughs> And what this one is doing is it's kind of trying to rationalize the idea that these two languages are sister languages are in, in fact, like much more closely related than you, than you might have thought. I'll point out a few things. One, uh, the BNF is a lot smaller. <laughs> B, the static type system is a lot smaller. <laughs> C, I didn't finish this part. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so I wanted to focus on this, the statics first, and this is basically taken from the MBA language and then shrunk down. Probably the coolest part to me is there's only one dynamic term. <laughs> there's only one dynamic language term at this point. And what that is is go dynamics static thing. Now, true, false, if all of the operations are now in the static language and solely in the static language in this one. And then there's still a way to get to the dynamic language. Now, you know, your, 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 your typical dynamic language person will say, where'd my dynamic language go? Like, you ate it. Like, it's gone. Like, this is not sisterly. It's like, what? So it's like, no, 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 no. You, what you want to do is sort of distinguish between the the language that you program in at the top level, and sort of what's happening kind of at the more fundamental level. And the whole point is sort of the difference, the, the key difference between the dynamic language and the static language is that the dynamic language doesn't make type distinctions, as many type distinctions as the static language did, right? You know, going back, it was like the dynamic language had one type distinction statically, I'm not even talking semantically, and it was, Right? It's like, yeah, we're good. The, the, the primary difference was that the, the static language makes distinctions between Booleans and between uh, naturals, and then uses that to structure your programs. And so adding, adding the dynamic language into this thing, really into this language, really amounts to providing the opportunity to not make those distinctions. But often we want those distinctions. Like, I program, you know, when I program, it happens to be an untyped racket. Uh, but I think with types. 
a lot of the time. It's like I was I just kind of not, did not know that I was taught types until like seven years after I was taught types. Um, but in my, in my view, types are much more of a, they're more about a mental discipline rather than a, a computer enforcement of invariance. But it's really nice when a computer can do things for you. I'm sort of like, arithmetic is a, a mental discipline. It is not the, the use of an HP 48 calculator so you can be a hipster. So there's, in this world, I'm allowed to kind of step outside of the syntactic discipline, but then I can step inside of it. And putting the two together, like there's a saying like, the, the dy dynamic languages don't, like they just have one type, or a dynamic language is really a unityped language, or some, uh, things like that. And at least at the level of the statics, that's true. The statics in no way bake in distinctions aside from this is a legal program. You can reason with types, but you have to do it externally, extrinsically from the, the language semantics. And here we're building a language that kind of has both. It lets you do some internal reasoning about statics while having your dynamic cake as well. So then finally, let me point out, so I have a, I have a, a Redux model for this language. And a bit that you're not, you're not seeing so far is, where's my dynamic language? So basically, it's like, you want the dynamic language? We can give it to you as a derived form. You can think of it as a f the dynamic language as a front end to the, the, you can think of the dynamic part of the mixed language as a front end to the minimal mixed language. And what we basically do is, every constructor in the language, like, you know, you want numbers? Like, I'm going to inject them into the dynamic world. I'm going to sort of, I'm going to opt individually in my statics to forget the type distinction. Similarly for, uh, probably if is the best one to look at, because what happens is, here's the static if, and it's getting arguments, and what you want to do is, if, if I want to say that I'm going to build an if from three dynamic things, well, if, this is the static if, it wants static things, so I'm going to say, you know, re-bring some of my dynamic thing into the static world, re-bring my dynamic thing into the static world, re-bring my dynamic thing into the static world, so now I have three static things. I can use my static if, because it, ha it has this type distinction, so it's going to kind of, this is where the connection for enforcement of my static uh, notions comes into play. And then once you're done, go back to the dynamic world. Okay? So I probably should give you a, a I, I should probably write down a, a translator uh, and maybe I'll do that in the LaTeX later, which takes the mixed language and translates it into the minimal mixed language and shows that it's all like type preserving. Uh, that way you can see like uh, uh, how monocolor dynamic code turns into kind of Paisley. So really, it ends up being a, it ends up being a derived form. So lots of this, so really now we've kind of smashed the language down and it's basically mostly the static language with this ability to kind of forget type information. That kind of makes sense? Okay. So what I'm going to briefly do now is uh, whack on a couple of examples in MBA just for you to see some of the kind of typing phenomena that happen at the high level before we worry about the low level. Because the, I guess I should, you know, I'm always told like when you're writing a paper, like tell, like tell everybody first that the butler killed him and then like tell your story. Um, so the main point I wanted to make is the, up where I'm getting is the minimal mixed Boolean and arithmetic language is really close to what uh, researchers call a gradually typed calculus. And the only, the, like the, the the basically, the only difference between this uh, language and a gradually typed language is that this feature here where you're going back and forth is written down as if it was like an operational feature, like, oh, I'm doing an operation. And in the gradually typed world, it's a type distinction. So it's really just type ascription. These two things go away, and colon, colon appears, which is why uh, Artem's question about what is this colon, colon thing sitting there, like, oh, I gave away the, the punchline, which is that the difference is type distinction. And you add ascriptions to your language, and then you're talking about what does it mean to ascribe between 
uh, the dynamic and static world. And that's going to be kind of the, the main pace of the, the, rest of, the rest of my talking. Questions? OK. So let me quickly pop up a couple of examples that should terrify you. Maybe. But it's like uh, we get down here and we're like, oh, OK. Uh, nope, we're too low. Yeah, so it's like, what counts as a program in this language? So naturally. We're quite comfortable with with our purely static one. As I, as I mentioned before, you know this is this is static. That's cool, but then things get kind of interesting. When I say, for instance, uh, oh, right. First, I'd, if I, from the dynamic world, add true. And we'll keep the, try and keep the example simple. And the point is, yeah, true is statically Boolean. And seven is definitely statically nat. And now I'm like, oh, that's nat, right? So you're sort of like, oh, there's this, there's this like, Globally, I can make it all work out. And, some, and then, on the other hand, if I, uh, if I do this one, then now it's again, it's sort of like I've got two types. Now for. For trying to write an intrinsic type system where your sort of your statics are supposed to give you the information that you, you know the information that you have about your program as you form it, there's something a little funky about this having two totally unrelated types in a way. Like we don't usually think of NAT as being bool unless we're programming in C. So there's this sort of question like, okay, so You can kind of get, start to get a hint of it if you if you sort of ask the system like you know what is the type of this expression and you're like yeah it's kind of both so then uh, as a static types person your mind starts going oh it's got to be either a union type or an intersection type. Like, it's like the only answers it could possibly be. Or, you know, if, you've, if you publish an oopsla, you're like, it's subtyping. <laughs> you know. And, like, you may laugh, but a lot of early research on trying to figure out how to combine static and dynamic checking started from subtyping, saying, like, it's got to be the case that we can think about the, the dynamic part as just, like, a top type, and then we're going to do subtyping. And then it's like, well, but how do I explain that part where I go from the dynamic world to the static world? You're like, downcasts, like, yeah, right? So it just seems like this natural, it seems like this natural feel. And uh, work was done on this uh, called uh, quasi-static typing. It was a Popple paper from the 90s by uh, Satish Thate. And he was trying to do this. How do I kind of partially statically type my programs but still have like some static guarantees? And so this was the jumping off point, the way in which this didn't work, and it doesn't work. And he upfront, in a certain sense, he upfront says it in the paper. Because uh, what he does is he adds, like, you know, everything can go to, c go to this dyn top type, and then everything can go down from dyn to anything else. And the moment you do that, your type system becomes the fonz. <laughs> it becomes everything's a legal program. So what, he, what happened was he found himself kind of back in the extrinsic world, where he's like, okay, so now I've written a type system that throws away nothing. So let me try and recover the ability to throw away some things and say these are not cool programs. And uh, he kind of wrote this static analysis sort of thingy afterwards. And you're like, well, what was the point of the type system then? Um, so it was, it was some influential work. And it was particularly influential because a fellow by the name of Jeremy Seek, uh, one of, a really good friend of mine, uh, saw this paper, decided he wanted to fix it, and came up with what's called gradual typing today. I mean, his first paper, gradual typing for functional languages with Walid Taha, who was his postdoc advisor and later my postdoc advisor, uh, 
kind of started this particular train of studying dynamic and static languages together. And uh, I want to be clear that this is not the beginning, this was clearly not the beginning of interesting research on static and dynamics. Um, that's a story for another talk, but there's a great deal of work in the literature that uh, tried to attack this problem and kind of this particular uh, observation has been uh, influential for like the last decade. And a number of other th pieces came together at the same time, including the idea of multi-language semantics and uh, some of Sam's work on inter-language migration. Uh, Sam observed to me the other day, and I didn't realize that all three of these papers, which were really influential, all got rejected from the same ICFP the same year. <laughs> so when your papers get rejected, you're like, yeah, I'm on the right train. It's like going to be legendary. Uh, <laughs> that might be the wrong statistical inference to take. But, um, but at the same time, it's worth pointing out that often things that are claimed to be invented by one person were kind of in the air and, and coalesced in different ways. But we really like to uh, put individuals on a pedestal for having invented everything, and that's usually not the right story. Um, the book Guns, Germs, and Steel talks about the idea of the steam engine, and it was a really neat story about how, no, it wasn't just one guy who came up with the steam engine like one morning like after he fell over and hit his head on the toilet or something. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a running story. So it's useful to keep that in mind as a researcher, that it's kind of environments kind of create ideas. Okay, enough spieling. So... Oh, yeah, yeah. Ah, both sides. Yes. Now what happens if your type system has like type constructor, the activity then you you get all of this You get everything. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the interesting part of this. That was kind of why subtyping seemed natural. Uh, if you sort of have this idea that I can have like a, a type of an all types at the top and then every type falls under it. And so uh, Jeremy and Waleed's insight was that we can look at, like, there's this sort of thing I have in my mind is like, it's not the case that every binary relation on types is subtyping. Uh, and that's uh, actually, to me, pretty insightful, <laughs> shall we say. OK. So what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to switch to the board for the, the remainder um, and then talk a little bit about thinking about gradual typing in this context. And then I'll start bringing out this idea of what's going on with types. So all on and up and mute. Okay. Are there other questions before I go on? Yeah. seems like a choice of like preferring the static version first. And I was wondering if like you could have an alternate formation where you start with the dynamic language and it's sort of uh, however that language works and then start to say, well, insert the static points here or something like that. Ah, OK, OK. So can, your name, can you remind me? Scott. Scott, OK. So what Scott's question was is, the way I set this up and I smashed things together, I said like basically like the static language ate the dynamic language, right? And then you're like, oh, like, could we do this the opposite? Dynamic language, eat the static language. Could we set it up that way? Um, so the answer ends up being, uh, in this context, no. Uh, but I, but uh, let me give you a caveat, though. Last time when I introduced the mixed language, I noted that I made the arbitrary decision that an entire program is a static program. Uh, so P, I set to just be equal to PS. And then my evaluation context always have a static program on the outside. And so you have to choose to go to the dynamic world. Now, it's perfectly reasonable, and there's no reason not to do the opposite and say that at the top of the world in the mixed language, it's a dynamic language. And maybe every once in a while, you want to make an assertion in your language using like a, one of these, using some static stuff. And then most of your program is, is, is dynamic. Uh, that's just a, a, a design issue for how you want to design your language and what purpose it serves. The reason that 
Uh, the reason that when you go down to the minimal language, the static eats the dynamic is because really the is not static versus dynamic, but precision of reasoning principles. So the static if, the, re the, main, reason, the main difference between the static if and the dynamic if is not their behavior, but the, that the static if says more type-wise about your program. And so uh, if you have two languages that differ by precision, then you're typically going, the, the more precise language is going to be the one that dominates at the low level because you want to preserve all of the extra stuff that you can while being allowed to forget as much of it as you want. So um, that was the sort of sense in which a dynamic language has one type, but it's really just, it's not even, it's, to me it's not about dynamic languages or static languages at all. It's about I have one language with a set of reasoning principles, I have another language with more precise reasoning principles, and I want to mix the two together seamlessly. And it just so happens, in order to, in order to make more distinctions, you need more distinctions. And that's why that ends up being the, the one that the other one's built on. Then I wonder, too, it's like, well, the way we, in this particular small example, we kind of cut off what would potentially be a valid program that has real meaning in a dynamic language, on the aesthetic side. So it seems like, it's like, yeah, we got the whole man except he chopped off his leg, and then you can't quite, you know, you have more information, but then, yeah. you know, so you kind of lost a little bit from the dynamic side. Now that we've like chosen this like little too restrictive static option. Okay, so interesting observation and totally wrong. Um, <laughs> but it, uh, but I'm not saying that I'm not saying that in a way to be like, oh, you don't know what's going on. What I'm saying is like you're saying a thing that many people say, and I think it's really important to to say that that's not the case, and it's easily forgotten. And the reason is, uh, from my point of view. My ultimate goal is to preserve both in their full glory. And what you don't want to do is l imagine that you had to write code in the minimal language. right? Because if, if I said, like, here's the minimal language, and that's what you get, you'd be absolutely right. You'd be like, man, now I've got it. Like, I, my, static, my dynamic language is totally subject to the whims of, of people who like static typing. The point I wanted to make is really we're still working in the mixed language where everything is even, where I wrote out the semantics with two separate things, you know, where everything, you know, everyone is friendly. But what I can show is that we can really conceive that idea of the two playing together in harmony by translating it to the smaller language. And all, all that is saying is that the meaning of the dynamic, the imprecise stuff, is the ability to choose to forget static stuff. That's the only interesting distinction. But at the end of the day, I'm allowed to, any program that I could write in BA, I can write in, in the mixed language, and its dynamics can be explained by the minimal one. So you can think of it as like a set of compilers all the way down. Does, does that uh, ease your concern, or is there a, a, something that I missed in, in what you were saying? Exactly. I agree with you. <laughs> and so it seems like, well, with the dynamic formulation, we're kind of limited, and there's not really, you know, in the, like, whatever the dynamic language, there isn't really a lot of interesting programs because we're talking about a pretty small number of like, primitives we're working with. But I mean, you could say, if true, then false, else seven, like, you know, it has a operational semantic that when you run it, it does kind of what you would expect, and that sort of makes sense in there. But mm -hmm. then the static version will never allow that. That's right. And so for me, I'm thinking like, like, okay, if you start adding richer things to the language, the dynamic side will kind of give you this, like the types can branch as well as the values can branch, whereas the static we're starting off right now, the, the types will never branch like that. Yeah, so, so what, we're, what we've been doing so far, I've been starting from a very simple uh, context mm -hmm. uh, to get the basic idea across and to raise, it is raise, it, it does, 
raise in your mind the issues that are not handled in the simple context. And roughly what I want to say is that we agree violently <laughs> and that the question is how do we scale this up to richer languages with more interesting features that you would want where the type system, uh, where you want to be able to kind of turn off the type system uh, static type part but still get guarantees and be able to write all the rich programs that you want. So I even want to be able to say that you can just like, if you flip the mixed language and say that it, like, oh, it starts dynamic and maybe you want some static stuff, that all of that is legal. Like you get both languages completely. We want the mixed language to be a conservative embedding of both the fully static and the fully dynamic language and extra stuff that you get by the magic of mixing. It's like, I want it all. Cool. Yeah. Uh, so what do you mean by turning on and off the type system? I mean, oh. define what he said yeah. as an example. So suppose we have a conditional expression. Mm -hmm. And is it like one branch of this conditional will allow? So am I able to exploit the information in conditional expression and propagate the information to the types? And then have some statically type state brand. Great question. Well, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm you're trying to, you're, you're trying to get a, you're trying to get a mental image of what I'm talking about. Um, so maybe I'll write an example program. And if I can do this off the top of my head. So I'll, let me first write it badly and then write it and then uh, talk about it. So Let's make believe I had like variables for a second. Okay. Okay, so let's say x is statically known to be a Boolean. Can I give this a semantic type? Right, let me see if I wrote the program right first. <laughs> oh, I didn't. Okay. <laughs> Therein lies the usual problem. I did something totally wrong here, didn't I? It's like not even well formed. <laughs> You're like, you can't give it a type because it's not even a, a term, let alone a program. This is the danger. So what I'm trying to do is say like, let's write a program. If x is true, then it returns false. <laughs> and then I wanted to flip these around. And then I think I need to flip these around. <laughs> Just replace the knot? Oh, OK, and then not flip things. Yeah. OK, that sounds good enough. Cool. I wanted to use a knot, but maybe I should not. OK. <laughs> Thanks. OK, now is that semantically well typed? Oh, I need the knot up top. Ah, like here. Oh, so it's, I do need a knot. Cool. OK, I wanted to use a knot. I got a knot. Great. Is that good? I can't program, so as you can tell. <laughs> Are we good? Any a little help? Bueller? Yeah. I, I want to ask a question about the, the double turn style. For me, there's no double turn style now. But oh, the, yeah, sure. Ask, ask me what the double turn style is. Yeah, so uh, in, the, like in the PDF, it was left as an exercise. What does double turn style mean? Ah. Mixed uh -huh. language. It seemed to me that um, semantic meaning of being a type means you lost a lot of value there. Right? So we, we used to be you know, double turn styles and we know it's going to at least run or overflow the static language. Uh -huh. 
Uh, yes, that's important. So, uh, sorry, can you remind me your name? Yeah, so what Max, Max is noting that once we mix the languages, we did lose power in our semantic typing because it used to be like, oh, all we know is like, well, the prog well typed programs don't go wrong, meaning they only underflow. Um, and that goes away. But last time I, I, I talked a little bit about this idea of partial, um, partial correctness, which is if it goes right, what do I know? So I said this thing like, if I get a value, what do I know? Oh, maybe I should write it out again. Yeah. So I rephrased it to lose information to say something like, if t has type nat, then Right, so I sort of hid the whole part where errors can happen. And I just said that if I get a value, if control arrives back here with a value, then it's a number. And now I'm not even talking at all about what could go wrong, which is, done, is not fully satisfying for every property of a language, but it's a reasoning principle that I can ascribe to my types. Make sense? Questions about that? OK, so can I give this a semantic type? Oh, I guess I need a context. Everyone looks a little worried. OK, let me ask a different question. What happens if I substitute true for x? What do I get? False. OK. What happens if I substitute false for x? False. So what if, x is, if x actually has the type bool, according to the other version of this, what it means is running some code is going to either die or get me a value, right? And if it gets me a value, what do I know about it being bool? <coughs> it's going to be true or false, right? So what I've done is I've created an interface here. And I'm, I should say, I'm assuming an eager language. I never work in lazy languages because um, history. I happen to go to a place where we did eager languages. So I'm assuming that I'm always substituting values for these because I'm in an eager context, right? So this piece of code is telling me that I'm expecting only true or false. Like, you will not give me something that's not true or false. This kind of gets us back to our question about let earlier. Like, what happens if I assign a dynamic thing to a variable that's supposed to be Boolean? To which I get glass eyes. Can I give this a semantic type? OK. What's the semantic type? Bool. OK. Cool? Everybody comfortable with that? OK. Can I type this in TBA? Extended with not and variables. Giving no. Is this a legal BA program? Yes? OK. Can I transform it into an MBA program? Yes. How? I'm going to take away the easiest answer right off the bat. <laughs> OK? <laughs> that being, there is more than one answer to how to do this. Make sense? OK, so think, think for a minute about how you, what else you might do besides like the obvious like punt and get a program that's going to have the same behavior. Yeah. OK, so if I floor the 7, sorry? I can never remember this. <laughs> oh, I have to. Oh, oh, OK, OK, oh, oh. 
Oh, I see, I see. See, it's, it's, this is exactly the mathematical problem because I think of this as a pile driver and I'm flooring the, I'm flooring the code because I never think of numbers because I'm afraid of them. So, <laughs> thank you, yeah. Because <laughs> it's like, to me it's lifting and then like flooring, like, which is totally wrong. So uh, don't take my terminology for, thank you for, yes, okay. This is why I don't do continuous math. Let me, let me keep going. Okay, so we can get this program into MBA and it's gonna have this semantic type. You know, and we're kind of ignoring the error features. So we have some reasoning, we were able to preserve some reasoning without, uh, uh, while still mixing in the ability to write code that's partially imprecise. Cool? Okay. Um, wow, yeah. I'm cutting into lunch a lot, although I started late. I will, I will wrap this up shortly, but what I wanted to get to was this idea of what's the deal with the types in this language? How do we think about the types in this language? What I contend is that we can replace this operator over here, which looks like an operational thing, with something, because this was all about sort of types and reasoning, and we can replace something that looks operational conceptually with a type ascription. And, you know, it would basically be like, yeah, like, right? But in the literature, I've never seen anyone do check mark, but I may like switch over just to cause problems. But you'll see two things. Question mark or star. What this stands for is we'll call it the unknown type. And this is really like the key idea in gradual typing is the idea that you, you can think about this as a type theoretic concept which is going to have operational implications. You start from the types and then you get to the dynamics while thinking about uh, preserving local reasoning principles. And it's like, Mah? like, how in the world does that happen? I'm like, ah, oh, luckily this isn't my last talk. Um, <laughs> so, the unknown type is really what I might re rephrase it as the most imprecise type. Or really, I'll say like the it's yeah it's the most imprecise type in my system. So it's not in in this system we had like bool and uh, net, and now we're adding this thing here. And so the question is, what's the relationship between that thing and the precise types? Nat is precise, bool is precise, and ultimately we're going to have a relationship which is to say nat's down here, bool is down here, and question mark is up here. So we end up having kind of a, an ordered structure in our language. Okay? And it's usually written, I would really say nat is less imprecise than question mark, or and bool is less imprecise than question mark. Question mark is less imprecise than itself, but that doesn't matter. It's a, it's a partial order structure. Okay? So you want to kind of conceptually think of it as like orthogonal to subtyping, orthogonal to most of the typing things that you want to think about. It's just saying like, I've got a, I've got a static type discipline and I'm going to talk about losing information progressively upwards. Like we're going into the third dimension in Flatland. And that was in many ways the kind of the key insight that, that, uh, that uh, has been developed over years by a number of people, including Fritz Hanglin, uh, Phil Wadler, and Jeremy Seek, like in different contexts. And that's just including, there's way more people. Uh, Fritz got here 
first that I've seen. But other people might have seen that too. And this kind of thing, as well, when I get into functions, you'll see this, something like this appears in the world of uh, type refinement, uh, data sort refinement. But this isn't exactly the same thing as that, because data sort refinement is all static. OK. Now what I want, the last thing I wanted to say to kind of get you ready for next time is that typically we'll write, we would write our type system to say, uh, let me write it this way. In our language we'll say a term, we'd say if t1 has type bool, t2 has type t, t3 has type t, then if t1, then t2, else t3 has type t. Familiar typing judgment, right? OK, so I talked a little bit the other day about how to read typing judgments. And it's sort of like, I think of it as a generator with filters. And you can always rewrite your, your, your any inductive derivation as being like, I'm generating the su a subset of term cross type. So it's like, oh, I forgot all the turn styles. My bad. So I'm creating a subset of term cross type. And what I'm going to do is like grab a bunch of terms and types and then run filters. And that's what I get, how I get my rules. So let me add the turn styles in. So I can rewrite this rule to basically make more things opaque and make the side conditions explicit. We do you use pattern matching notation because it works really nicely. But if you implement a type checker, you'll find that having side conditions makes it a little nicer. So what I would write is, if t1 has type t1 and t2 has type t2 and t3 has type t3, Then if t1, then t2, else t3 has type t4. And then I got to do some stuff. Make sense? So now I have to state some side conditions on the side. What side conditions do I want? So I want t1 is equal to bool. Right? And then what would you say after that? T2 equals T3 <laughs> equals T4. OK? So would you say this is equivalent? OK. Now I'm going to show you uh, something funky, and you'll, we'll see why that matters in just a second. And this is like where you should be scared. So. If I write a type checker, the way I usually think about it is terms that I recognize come in and, work, and I break them into pieces, and then types come out, and I do stuff with them. And that's kind of like what I'm doing here, right? So let me show you something that, I, uh, that me and my co-author Matteo Chimini figured out, which is kind of terrifying. Let me instead write here t4 again, and then say t4 equals equate t2, t3, which is to say the type of the entire expression is now a function of the sub-expressions, some of the sub-expressions, right? But it's a partial function of some of the sub-expressions. So how I'm going to define equate is really easy. It's equate is a partial function from type cross type to type. And it's basically, I have one equation I need to satisfy, and it's equate of t, t, t equals t and undefined otherwise. So I make the undefined otherwise explicit 
to say that I'm not willing to accept any other things in, in this function. It's really a partial function. You could say it's the, least, it's the least partial function that satisfies this thing, but that starts getting into like, what's up with least functions? Just say like, that's the thing that's true about it. Okay? So can you buy that that's, if you think about it for a minute, can you buy that this rule is still the same rule as that rule? Okay? So part of the intuition behind this, or at least the way Matteo always looks at it and the way I sometimes look at it when I have my, my what would Frank do hat on, is it's sort of like logic programming, where if you look at uh, Red X, it has this thing called modes when you put in your type system, and you'd say like, some things are inputs and some things are outputs. Mathematically, all that's doing is making a, uh, a claim about the relation that you're defining. You're basically saying, for all types, for all terms, there exists uh, a type such that blah, blah, or, or not, roughly speaking. Uh, in, in, in essence, actually, it's saying for all, for all terms and for all types, if, there, if, something has a t if some term has a type, then it's unique. It's kind of saying a uniqueness thing, but maybe not like, I mean, I'm talking about uh, red X and I'm like fudging a bit. But really, the, the main thing I wanted to say is mode is kind of talking about trying to prove a property of the entire thing by induction over the structure of the rules, where you say, oh, well, if every rule has this structure, then I'm going to think of this as an input and this as an output then I can show that like, an input will get me an output that's a function of the, in, of the things that I got, and it's a sub-expression. So it's just restructuring the type system. Now where this becomes important is to say, how do I take my gradual language, how do I take my static language and my dynamic language and build a type system that can now deal with this imprecision between static and dynamic? That's kind of the key question. So the secret is, there's like, let me give you the first secret, and then we'll worry about the second secret next time, because lunch. The first secret is, we're not going to talk about equality anymore between precise types, because we've built a bigger language that has more types that are meaningful, and they talk about the idea of reasoning in the face of imprecision. So what we're going to do is we're going to replace all instances of equality with something called consistency. And this was really, this was the first instance of uh, gradual typing that came about. This idea is due to Sophia Drosopoulou at Imperial uh, in a, the nominal typed context. And then it was adapted to structural typing by Jeremy Seek, who figured out that you could apply this to a language with like first class functions and products and structural things. Luckily, our system looks a lot like Sophia's. It's sort of nominal. But the basic idea is that, and consistency is, it's written like that. It's a tilde. And it's contained in gradual types across gradual types. It's a relation on gradual types. The nice thing is that we can define it in terms of our static type discipline and precision. So I'm going to use the symbol U for gradual types. OK? So a type U1 is consistent with U2 if there exists some static type T1 that U1 is less imprecise than, and there exists a static type T2 such that T2 is less imprecise than, and these two are equal. So the idea is like, in my mental model, this is a bubble of static types. And maybe one of them works out. And this is a bubble of static types. And maybe one of them works out. And the question is, do these two bubbles in some way match up according to equality? I've lifted the idea of equality to consistency. 
Now, the reason I phrase it this way is because not every type system uses type equality. Some of them use subtyping. And it turns out you can use the same thing, and I'll show you this in more detail later, but we get something called consistent subtyping, which was uh, invented also by Jeremy Seek, but uh, using much more complicated intuitions uh, years ago, shall we say. Yeah? So what was the type again? Uh, gra gradual type. Yeah, so what, what is it? Because it's between normal type and... And question mark, okay. yeah. It'll get richer later, but those are the only three that we have right now. I just added this idea of question mark. So this, these are my gradual types. And they're a superset of my static types. So the key, the key idea that I'm going to stop with at this point, because we really need to eat, is I'm sorry about that. I'm going to blame Amal since she's not in the room. So, <laughs> the, the, or my stomach is definitely like plotting her, her consumption. Um, <laughs> it's like, so much for being vegetarian. So, uh, <laughs> although if Amal's vegetarian, can, and, 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 let's <laughs> so the key, one of the key ideas here is what, I, uh, what is called conservative extension. I'd said already that I want to have the entire dynamic language, and I want to have the entire static language. I want both at the same time. They have to have them. My reasoning has to weaken because I've introduced some imprecision, but I really, for all practical purposes, want both languages and maybe some stuff in between. You know, maybe I'm not going to program in the mixed language, but I'm going to program directly in the gradual language because I want to be even more fine-grained uh, as my language gets more sophisticated. So I want to build a bigger language So I have, a stat I have my static language, I have my dynamic language, and I want to build a bigger language. So the language idea kind of matches the gradual idea. So the gradual language is this thing. And I want both of these to be conservative conservatively embeddable in the gradual language, which means as a dynamic language programmer, I want to write completely dynamic language programs and just like not know that the static thing exists and know that this language contains them. Same with the static. I want them both, and the result is sort of this like bigger, richer system that happens to have both of them in it. And so what's interesting here you'll look at is this relation preserves equalities and inequalities on static types. As long as I stay static, it always recognizes exactly the same thing as type equality. And the same ends up being true for, for static types, uh, for static subtyping, that it will exactly preserve subtyping otherwise. And then once you start adding gradual things in, things start to get a little bit more interesting, but still end up being kind of compositional. And that's kind of the, uh, the key to the design of this, this gradual type substrate on which you can re do both dynamic and static programming. Cool? OK, so I'm going to stop now. <laughs> like, yay, food. So next time, what we're going to do, I mean, it's like I've, I've taken a long time kind of laying out the idea of static and dynamic languages and showing you how this whole idea ends up pushing down to this gradual language. And that's where most of the research is happening in this kind of space. So. You'll, if I talk to you about gradual languages, I want you in your mind to think about how you can lift back up to this other world if you care. But you can also program in the intermediate language as well. Okay. Thanks a lot.